G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the book of 2 Peter. I pray that it will be a blessing to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thanks for coming along. So welcome to session two. We're looking at chapter two, verse three to chapter three, verse 18, which will finish off the book for us today. Um, bit of a, just a, a, a bit of a recap now. Um, the last session, we finished off with the, with, the, with the danger of false, we're in the danger of false teachers. Um, and one of the things that we see about them is that they bring destructive heresies. And, and another thing that they did was that they denied both the work and person of Jesus. Now, some of their deeds, what's going to happen with false teachers is that they're going to infect others. And we find that with these false teachers we see here, uh, immorality is, is what they will infect others with. That's their, that's their drawing card. They're going to bring discredit to the Messiah, to the cause of Messiah because you know often uh, it will cause others to blaspheme the name of Jesus. They're, they're, these false teachers we're seeing here will only uh, seek to make money out of the New Testament believers um, who they'll seek to rule over them. So today we're into the destruction of these false teachers. We're looking at uh, verse second part of verse three to verse nine. Well, let's look at verse three first. Verse, the second part of verse three says, whose sentence now from of old lingers not and their destruction slumbers not. So here, uh, Peter makes three main points. The first point we see here is to describe the sentence. Uh, their sentence will not linger. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> their sentence will not linger and it will not slumber. It, it's going to come. The point is that when the timing of the judgment arrives, there'll be no delay in carrying it out. In verse 4, for if God spared not angels when they sinned, but cast them down to hell and committed them to pits of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So the second point here is in verses 4 to 8. We'll just read verse 4 there, where he again teaches a, a lesson from history. God delivers both to and from judgment. And Peter shows this by giving us four examples. The first example we find in verse 4. And this is a judgment of the angels of Genesis 6. These angels have now been cast down to hell and committed to pits of darkness. Now, the, the Greek word here that, that uh, Peter uses for hell is the word Tartarus. Now, Tartarus is a section of Sheol or Hades, which is what we call hell. Sheol is Hebrew, Hades is Greek. Uh, um, and this, is, this place, Tartarus, is a permanent place of confinement for certain fallen angels. Now, another part of Sheol or Hades is known as the abyss. And that's a temporary place of confinement for fallen angels or demons. Sometimes when a demon is cast out of a man, the demon spends some time in the abyss, but he is eventually released. It's similar to a jail sentence. You know, Tartarus is more like a life sentence. It's a permanent place of confinement. Now, Josephus, the, uh, the, the historian, he refers to Tartarus as a place where pagan gods are chained. Now, the fallen angels, these are the ones, Genesis 6, 1 to 4, who married or who intermarried with human women, and they're now confined in Tartarus. So that they'll never be free to roam again. And eventually they're going to move from, from uh, Tartarus to the lake of fire. So these demons in Tartarus are committed to pits of darkness, to be reserved onto judgment. And the judgment is the great white throne judgment after which they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. So the fallen angels of Genesis 6 are an example of how God is able to deliver to judgment. And then in verse 5, it says, He spared not the ancient world, but preserved Noah, with seven others, a preacher of righteousness, when he brought a flood upon the world, world of the ungodly. So here we see the second example now in verse five, and this is the destruction 
of Noah's generation while Noah was actually spared. So here we see he's being delivered from judgment. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, Genesis doesn't tell us this, uh, but it's actually part of Jewish tradition. Uh, Noah is an illustration of how uh, God can deliver from judgment, but the ungodly were all destroyed by the flood. So the rest of humanity is an example uh, of how God can deliver to judgment. So Noah was delivered from judgment by God, while the rest were all delivered to judgment by God. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, having made them an example unto those that should live ungodly. So this is the third example now, and this is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is, a, as, an, this is as an example to others not to live ungodly lives. And again, this illustrates to us how God can deliver to judgment. And this is the entire cities are delivered to judgment. And then in verses seven to eight, we have the deliverance of Lot, uh, Abraham's nephew, and delivered righteous Lot, sore distressed by the lascivious life of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their lawless deeds. So this is the, now the fourth example. And this in verse 7, 8 is a deliverance of Lot while Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Now, here, Lot is an example of how God can deliver from judgment. Uh, first part of verse 7 clearly calls Lot righteous. Now, you know, most sermons about Lot describe him as a believer who compromised his faith and compromised with the world. But the, the Bible actually never portrays Lot in that kind of a negative sense. The fact that God is going to deliver Lot shows that there was a greater spirituality than most preachers have recognized. He was a righteous man. And the, the text actually declares that Lot was righteous. When he saw the sins of Sodom, his righteous soul was vexed or was greatly vexed. Now, People claim that because Sodom was a homosexual city, Lot had no business living there. Well, you know, if that were true today, if that were true today, man, there'd be a lot of cities we can't live in. And it'd also be wrong for believers today to live, for instance, in Sydney or, or in San Francisco or in Bangkok or any, any of these places which are, where, which are overtly homosexual cities. There's nothing wrong biblically with living uh, with believers living in these cities and there's nothing wrong biblically with lot living in sodom he was never condemned for moving to sodom rather it stated that lot was a righteous man you know verses uh, going on in second part of verse seven and verse eight it says there that the wickedness of sodom vexed his righteous soul and he was sore distressed by the sins of sodom so again what we see here is that lot is an example of how God can deliver from judgment. In verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to keep the unrighteous on the punishment onto the day of judgment. So Peter's third main point is in verse 9, where he now gives the principle, and that is that God knows how to deliver the, the godly out of temptation, and he knows how to keep the righteous the unrighteous on the punishment. And that's until the great white throne judgment. So the period between death and the final judgment is still a time of punishment. <clears throat> now in verses 10 to 22, we now have the description of false teachers. Uh, we'll just read verses 10 and 11 to start with. Uh, this is chapter two, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of defilement and despise dominion, daring, self-willed, they tremble not to rail at dignities, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, bring not a railing judgment against them before the Lord. So Peter, he now diverts a, a pretty lengthy section here 
to the description of the false teachers. And it's not a very loving section. Uh, nevertheless, you know, when it comes to false teachers who lead people astray, there can uh, only be harsh words for them. And in this description of false teachers, Peter points at eight specific characteristics. First of all, in, in verse 10, false teachers are characterized by lawlessness, seeing in their railings against dominion or, or those in authority. Their spirituality is that of walking after the flesh, which means they're controlled by their sin nature and, and therefore they're characterized by lust of defilement and, and they despise dominion. The phrase here, despise dominion, means that they do not subject themselves to authority. Now, in their case, they do not have the spirit of God. Therefore, these guys are unregenerate uh, men. And then second, uh, in these verses, false teachers are also characterized by arrogance. And their arrogance is seen in that they rail at dignities. And this is against angels who are greater than themselves. Peter points out that even lesser angels who are holy do not rail against greater angels. And that's even if the greater angels happen to be fallen angels. And this was the case uh, disputing over Moses's body. Now, this is not a function of angels. Uh, they do not, uh, they do not uh, rail against uh, others in authority. These men, we see here, these false teachers are arrogant. They rail against angels of all kinds, even those who are greater than themselves. Verse 12 tells us that these, as creatures without reason, born mere animals to be taken and destroyed railing in matters whereof they are ignorant, shall in their destroying surely be destroyed. So the third thing we see here in verse 12 is that their ignorance is like that of animals that were destined to destruction. Creatures without reason. They were born mere animals to be taken and destroyed. So what we see here is Peter is saying that they rail at things that they know nothing about. And as a result, in trying to destroy others, they're going to be destroyed themselves. And this harsh language from Peter is an indication of how serious he considered these heresies to be. Moving on in verse 13, suffering wrong as the hire of wrongdoing, men that counted pleasure to revel in the daytime, spots and blemishes, reveling in their deceivings while they feast with you. So the fourth thing we see here in verse 13 these, is that these false teachers are characterized by wrongdoing and deception. And their licentiousness is seen in that they do not even wait until night to practice their, their, their orgies, uh, but they practice them in the daytime. This is their revelings. They're characterized by Im immoral spots and blemishes. So while they're feasting with believers, pretending to have a sense of spirituality, in reality, they're actually deceiving believers to entice them away into their style of life. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing on steadfast souls, having a heart exercised in covetousness, children of cursing. So the fifth thing we see about these uh, false teachers is that they are guilty of immorality and licentiousness in that their eyes are full of adulterous women. That's what it means. In other words, what, what we see here is that false teachers see each woman as a potential adulteress to the extent that this has become their way of life. They cannot cease from sin because they're unregenerate. Uh, they, do, they don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them to enable them to cease from sin. And so they covet weaker brethren, not to build them up in the Lord, but to exercise authority over them and to destroy their spiritual life. So these weaker brethren uh, then fall into a state of immorality because of these false teachers. And as a result, they are cursed children because God's curse is now upon them. <clears throat> 
Right, this is the, the false teachers here. And then six, we see in verses 15 to 16, false teachers are guilty of the why of Balaam. Remember Balaam, Numbers 23, 24, verse 15 says, forsaking the right way, they went astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the hire of wrongdoing. But he was rebuked for his own transgression. A dumb ass spoke with man's voice and stayed the madness of the prophet. Now, Balaam was a, was a, was a seer. Uh, and he was guilty of forsaking the right way, and, and so are these false teachers. Balaam knew what was the right thing to do, but he chose to go in the opposite direction. He was guilty of greed and covetousness, and so are these false teachers. Now, the reason Balaam finally decided to go the wrong way was in order to become wealthier. In the same way, these false teachers are exercising false spiritual authority for the purpose of using believers to enrich themselves. At least Balaam was rebuked by his own dumb ass, his donkey. And he had the sense to listen. He had the sense to listen to what the donkey had to say. <laughs> so, Balaam realized that this animal could only speak as a result of supernatural power. And therefore, he learned a lesson from his ass while these false teachers are not willing to learn anything. Whereas Balaam's madness was stayed, theirs will not be stayed. He goes, Peter goes on to say that these are springs without water and mists driven by, by a storm for whom the blackness of darkness hath been reserved. So the seventh thing we see here in verses 17 to 19 is that these guys are empty of content. They, are, they may appear to be great Bible teachers, but in reality, they're devoid of content. In, in the first part of verse 17, uh, they're like promising springs, but they produce no water. So these false teachers, they make promises of spiritual refreshment, but they actually produce nothing. They're empty, clouds without water. In the second part of verse 17, it says that they're destined for the blackness of darkness. So this is one of several descriptive terms for the lake of fire, the place of utter darkness. Uh, it's a bit paradoxical here because normally fire provides light, but actually in the case of the lake of fire, the fire is only there for torment. There'll be no light, it'll be totally dark. No light of any kind. So those in the lake of fire will live in a state of perpetual darkness. And that is for eternity. Going on to verse 18 and 19. For uttering great swelling words of vanity, they entice in the lust of the flesh by lasciviousness. Those who are just escaping from them that live in error. Promising them liberty, while they themselves are bondservants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he also brought into bondage. So what we see in verse 18 is that because a false teachers are empty of content, they entice others into false doctrines by offering the fulfillment of the lusts of the flesh. False teachers, they may sound great. In fact, a lot of them do. They may be eloquent, but their speech is nothing but great swelling words of vanity. They confuse people by using words that no one else understands. And their purpose is to catch people by using the hook of licentiousness or, or shameful immorality. And they especially target new believers who have not yet matured in the faith. Or it can be old believers who have not yet matured in the faith too. Because new believers are only now just escaping from them that live in error. So the only new believer, they've only just escaped from that. They may not yet understand all the principles of resisting such temptation. And the temptation towards sexual passion is perhaps among the greatest temptations that man has to face. In fact, the whole industry of pornography today is based upon the strength of that temptation. And these false teachers are offering believers the possibility of living spiritually while still practicing the fulfillment of the lust of the flesh. Now, you know, 
any proper Bible teacher will tell you that that is, that is totally false. And in verse 19, we see that the false teachers are declared to be bond servants of corruption. So false teachers are guilty of their promising freedom, but by promising liberty, they place believers into bondage that enslaves them to that which by which these guys are now overcome. So having once become enslaved, it is very difficult to free a believer from that kind of bondage. The eighth thing we see is now in verses 20 to 22. Now, uh, they're now subject to greater judgments. Now, um, uh, this is a, a, a difficult passage. Uh, at this point, there, now, there are two options here as to whom Peter is referring to. Now, is he still speaking of the false teachers who are unbelievers, or is he now dealing with the new believers who have been deceived by the false teachers? Now, the context uh, in verses 20 to 22 appears to favor the second option as to whom uh, Peter is referring to, and that is the, 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 the new believers who have been uh, deceived by false teachers. Between verses, uh, that transition between verses 17 and 18, uh, we have a, a transition of subjects here. Verses 10 to 17 are speaking of the false teachers who are unbelievers. But verses 18 to 22 are speaking of the victims of the false teachers. You know, these victims are new believers who are deceived and they return to a life of immorality only to discover it's not as fulfilling as the false teachers implied. According to verse 18, the false teachers, they entice others into false doctrine by promising the fulfillment of the lust of the flesh. Now, false teachers who are bond servants of corruption are out to catch new believers by using the hook of licentiousness and shameful immorality. However, according to verse 19, by promising their deceived followers freedom, false teachers actually place their followers into bondage by which they are now overcome. So, we're looking at this towards the believers who have been caught by the false teachers. For if after they have escaped the defilement of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the last state is now become worse with them than the first. So verse 20 here uh, states the familiar proverb, which is the last state is become worse with them than the first. Uh, this is a proverb also found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 45. Matthew 12, 45. The reason this last state is worse than the first is that at one time they had escaped the defilements of the world by their association with the church through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the Greek word that, that Peter uses here for defilements, is, and this is the only place it's used, um, and the Greek word for knowledge here is the same word that he used back in chapter 1, verse 2, and verse 3, and verse 5, and verse 6. And this shows us here that Peter is actually referring to salvation knowledge. So what he's saying is that having escaped the defilements, these, these new believers have now again entangled themselves therein, and they're now overcome. And then in verse 21, Peter makes a contrast now between the better and the worse. Concerning the better, he declares, for it were better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Now, it means that not to have known the way of righteousness in this life, not better for eternity, it's better in this life for them not to have known the way of righteousness, but it's not better for them for eternity. And concerning the worse, he says, then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So it is worse in this life for these new believers to have been brought into the bondage of verse 19. They are now subject to temporal judgment. That, that's why it's worse for them, because they're now subject to this judgment. 
There's no mention of hell or Gehenna, which is a lake of fire in this portion. So what we're seeing here, this is this the issue here is not a loss of salvation, but the issue is temporal judgment. It is better never to have to never have known the way of righteousness in this life than to have known it and then turn back to an immoral lifestyle. Now, there are three reasons why the life of a believer would be worse if he chooses to return to sin than it would have been if he had never become a believer. First up, the conviction of sin is going to be greater. As a non-believer, you don't have a conviction of sin. Everything's good. You're never bad. Secondly, there is the possibility of church discipline now being uh, held over you. And third, which is, which is more definitely, uh, he's now subject to divine discipline, which any, uh, any father will dis discipline his child. We see the proverb in verse 22. It has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog turning to his own vomit again, and the, the sow that had washed were wallowing in the mire. So here in verse 22, Peter concludes with the proverb, the dog returns to its own vomit. And this comes from Proverbs 26, verse 11. And the pig that has washed returns to, to the wallowing in the mire. What, what is he talking about here? Well, these guys, these believers, they've gotten rid of the defilements of the world when they came to faith. But rather than doing the right thing by eating righteous food, by, by feeding and sound doctrine, instead what they do is they go back to their vomit. They go back to their filth. Now, both, uh, both the pig and, and, the, and the dog here were free from their filth at one time. Only of believers, now only of believers can it be said that they were free from their sins. But by going back, they have forgotten their cleansing, which is what we saw back in chapter 1, verse 9. Um, just as the by uh, dogs and pigs, we also see them together in, in um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, dogs and pigs. Now we see the mockery of the last days. And this we find in chapter 3, verses um, uh, the warning concerned that we have a warning here concerning the second coming in chapter 3, 1 to 13. And then we have the mockery of the last days in chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Now, Peter in verses 1 to 2 uh, will bring the remembrance to them. This is now, beloved, the second epistle that I write unto you. And in both of them, I stir up your sincere mind by putting you in remembrance that you should remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So as Peter begins to speak about the mockery of the last days, he again points out the purpose of this epistle, and it is to bring to remembrance. And in the first part of one, in the first part of verse one here, he reminds his readers that this is the second epistle he has written. The first one was First Peter. Now, you know, he, he, he could have, he, 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 admittedly, he could have, refer, could be referring to another letter he wrote to a different group, but uh, a letter that is now lost. But most likely, it, you know, he means that this is the second epistle to the first epistle of, of Peter. Remember, the first epistle had to do with persecution. The second one here has to do with uh, false teachers and false doctrine. So in the second part of verse one, he presents the purpose of this epistle. It's to stir up to remembrance. Again, this is not a new truth he's teaching them, but it's simply a reminder of what they have already been taught. That you should... <clears throat> now in verse two, he points at the two sources of the doctrine they have already been taught and should remember. The two sources are the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. The Old Testament is the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And the New Testament is the commandments of the Lord and Savior through, he says here, your apostles. In chapter one, he dealt with the means of growth 
which included both Old Testament revelation and New Testament revelation. So while the Old Testament revelation came by the prophets, the New Testament revelation came by the apostles. Then we have the mockery in verses three to four. Knowing this first, that in the last days, mockers shall come with mockery, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For from the day that the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So now in this passage, Peter deals with the mockery itself, and he points out two aspects here. First of all, in verse 3, he addresses the timing, the timing of the mocking in the last days. Now, in the last days, mockers or, or scoffers you might have will come with mockery, walking after their own lusts. And Peter, in this epistle, is really warning against two things, something which is immediate and something which is distant. In chapter 2, Peter warned them that false teachers were going to come in the immediate future within their generation. And Jude tells us that they have come. In chapter 3, he looks ahead to the distant future in the last days, and he is warning those living in the last days, the day, which is a, these are the days preceding the second coming, that those days are going to be characterized by mockery. Like the false teachers soon to come, the mockers of the last days will also be characterized by walking after their own lusts. And they take pleasure in following their natural desires, not the will of God. Now, second, in verse four, he deals with the content of the mockery. They'll be mocking the doctrine of the second coming. They'll raise the question, where is the promise of his coming? It will be attack against the doctrine of the second coming. Now, their argument against the second coming is going to be based on the humanistic doctrine of what is called uniformitarianism. Uniformitar Uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism. Say that fast. Which says that all things continue to be the same from creation. Everything follows one cycle after another. The globe, the, the, the globe revolves on its axis and the planets revolve around the sun and that nothing is ever going to interrupt this uniform cycle. That's what they believe. That's what they say. But the implication that they're making is that God never interfered supernaturally with this natural cycle. And they make two assumptions here. The first assumption that they make is that their knowledge of historic events and processes is full and complete. They, they, they reckon they know everything. So if there was divine intervention in the past, they would know it and be able to prove it scientifically. The second assumption is the absolute, absolute uniformity of nature. Nothing breaks the cycle of nature. Actually, there's a rabbinic parallel based on Psalm 8950. And the rabbinic commentary on that psalm states that the mockers have scoffed at Messiah's coming. The, 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 the uh, mockers say he delays so long that they say he is not coming. So this is what the mockers will be mocking. This is the content and the reason for the mockery which now leads to Peter's rebuttal. And this is in verses five to seven. For this they willfully forget that there were heavens from of old and an earth compacted out of water and amidst water by the word of God, by which means the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens that now are and the earth by the same word have been stored up for fire, being reserved against the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So in Peter's rebuttal here, Peter points out three things. First of all, in the first part of verse five, these false teachers are guilty of willful ignorance. They're not merely ignorant because they lack knowledge. The knowledge is available to them, but they refuse to make use of it. And this is true of modern evolutionists. It is not that they do not know the doctrine of creation, but they choose to willfully forget the knowledge that is available to them. 
Therefore, they are guilty of willful, willful ignorance. Second, in verse, in second part of verse five and verse six, God has interfered with the psyche by means of judgment once before. God used the judgment of water. Peter states in verse five that the earth was compacted out of water and through water by the word of God. Now, the background to this statement is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. And Peter's point here is that God has interfered with the old natural cycle once before in order to make this a usable planet. He created it out of nothing, and then, after it became chaotic, he brought order to it. By which means the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So in verse 6, he goes on to state that the earth has been destroyed by water. This could be in reference to two possible instances. It might be a reference to the result of Satan's fall in Genesis 1, verse 2, when water was upon the face of the earth and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Or more likely, this might be a reference to the Noahic flood. Uh, either way, either way, God has interfered with the natural cycle through his judgment by water once before. Third, in verse 7, Peter states that God will interfere again with judgment, but this time it's going to be by judgment by fire. It's, uh, the, it says the judgment is there being stored up for fire. So this present earth is heading for judgment, and someday it will be destroyed by fire. But even now, the earth is being stored up for this judgment of fire. The earth is being kept for the day of judgment and for the destruction of ungodly men. Yeah, in conclusion here, Peter's rebuttal to the doctrine of uniformitarianism, hey, got it right that time, is that God has supernaturally interfered with nature before, and he fully intends to do it again. So these mockers have assessed these facts but they're guilty of willful ignorance. Now, with the doctrine of the Lord's return in verses 8 to 13 of chapter 3. And here we have God's relationship to time in verses 8 to 9. But forget not this one thing, beloved, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to you, would, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Peter teaches in verse 8 that God is not bound by time. Therefore, there's no delay in God's timetable. Peter makes reference here to Psalm 90, verse 4, when he says that to God a day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. As far as God is concerned, he sees everything as still vividly present. He sees everything in one hit, one vision. What appears to man to be a delay is no delay in God's timetable. Everything is going exactly according to God's plan. Now, it's important to know here that men and God have different perspectives. That which man regards as, long, as a long time is as one day to the eternal God. In fact, it's been 2,000 years uh, since, the, uh, since the crucifixion and ascension of Christ. So it's like two days. Days is a 1,000 years. So it's, it's, you know, there is no delay. As a, we have a long silence to man in that 2,000 years, but it's just a moment to God. Some people have used this verse to teach a prophetic timetable in the sense that when the Bible speaks about one day, it's a thousand years in God's prophetic scheme. So they, what they do is they teach that the six days of creation refers to 6,000 years in human history. The seventh day or the Sabbath will then be the thousand years of the millennium. Now, Peter does not state that a day is a thousand years. That's not what he's stating. He's simply saying that to God, who is not bound by time, a day is as or like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as or like a day. There's no doctrine in scripture that teaches a day equals a thousand years in prophecy. None whatsoever. In verse 9, Peter then presents the reason for the seeming delay. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And the word slack in Greek means impotence or weak or inability. The point is that God never delays because he's weak or he's because he's impotent or because of inability to carry out what he says he's going to carry out. The delay is due to the long suffering of God. Now, God is merely extending his period of grace. He wishes to give opportunity for all to be saved. And the purpose of God is not delayed, for he's not slack in keeping his promise. So from the human perspective, there appears to be a delay, but everything is, in, is according to God's plan and timetable. In verses 10 to 13, we see the great tribulation. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This new section here um, deals with the great tribulation, the seven years that precede the second coming. And Peter makes two points here. He, first of all, he makes the point about the certainty uh, of the coming of the day of the Lord and about the believer's lifestyle. They're the two points. In verse 10, Peter emphasized the certainty of the coming of the day of the Lord. It will come with suddenness and unexpectedness, just like a thief in the night. The same point is made by Paul in first. Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 to 3. The day of the Lord will hit the unbeliever with the suddenness and unexpectedness of a thief in the night. You know, during the tribulation, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The Old Testament background to this statement is found in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4, which mentions the same occurrence. Jesus emphasizes the same thing in Matthew 24, verse 29. It's also found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 14, and chapter 8, verse 12. While the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the earth will be burned up by the judgments of the great tribulation. Many of these are fiery judgments. For example, in the trumpet judgments of Revelation 8 and 9, the first, second, third, and sixth trumpet judgments are judgments of fire. In the bowl judgments of Revelation 16, the fourth bowl judgment is a judgment of fire. And during the great tribulation, there'll be a burning of the earth. In fact, somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the earth's surface will be destroyed during the great tribulation. And in this case, uh, Peter is not dealing with the total destruction of the globe by fire in Revelation 20. What he's doing here is that he's referring to the burning of the surface of the earth. And contrary to the mockers' claims, the earth is not eternal. One day it's going to be rolled up. In light of his, of his coming judgment, Peter deals in verses 11 to 13 with the believer's lifestyle. Seeing that these things are thus all to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all living, in all holy living and godliness? What should their lifestyle be in view of the coming of the great tribulation? Oh, just for those who, uh, who, who might not know, um, the day of the Lord is a, it's a technical, the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, um, it's a technical term for the, the, the great tribulation. Now, according to verse 11, believers should be characterized by holy and righteous living, and that involves walking or living based on walking by the Spirit, not by the flesh. It involves keeping the commandments that the Lord has made applicable to believers. In verse 12, looking for and earnestly desiring the coming of the day of God, by reason of which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, according to verse 12, believers should be characterized by looking for and desiring the day of God, the day of Jehovah. This is, this is quite an, uh, uh, an awesome statement to make here. The day of God is the same as the day of the Lord. This is the most common biblical name for the seven years of the Great Tribulation. 
And here, Peter is encouraging believers to earnestly seek, desire, and look for the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, the day of God, the day of the great tribulation. But according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. The reason to look forward to the tribulation is explained in verse 13. The kingdom will be set up by means of the tribulation judgments. Believers' lifestyles right now in this age will determine their future position in the kingdom. The new heavens and the new earth Peter is speaking about in this passage are not the eternal heavens and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. Rather, he's talking about the new heavens and new earth of the millennium. The millennial new heavens and new earth are the same new heavens and the new earth spoken of twice by, either, by Isaiah the prophet. In Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25, and Isaiah 66, verse 22. The earth will have to be renovated for the millennium. The earth will be greatly destroyed by fire through the fiery judgments of the great tribulation. This destruction is described in two phrases. The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So, for the millennium, the earth will have to be miraculously renovated, and hence the phrase new heavens and a new earth. It's only through the tribulation judgments that the kingdom will be set up. Righteousness will dwell in this kingdom, and the believer's lifestyle here and now is going to determine their position in the kingdom. Therefore, the reason to desire the great tribulation is not because of what will happen during that period. But believers should desire the great tribulation because of its result, and that is the messianic kingdom. The fact that righteousness will dwell in the kingdom is a truth also taught by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 to 7, Jeremiah 23, 5 to 7, Jeremiah 33, 16, Jeremiah 33, 16, and Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel 9, 24. And the first one was Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. Now we see the exhortation here to good conduct in verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for these things, give diligence that you may be found in peace without spot and blameless in his sight. So Peter wants his readers to be zealous for righteousness. The way to be zealous for righteousness is a twofold process. First of all, be zealous for righteousness in peace. Peace comes from a knowledge of God's plan that shows that God is in control. And this is followed by a perfect reliance upon him. They must seek the knowledge of God's plan with diligence. And if they do this, they'll be found in peace. Peace with God and peace with fellow believers. Second. Believers need to be zealous for righteousness without spot or blemish and blameless in his sight. So this condition here is in contrast to the condition of the false teachers with their spots and blemishes back in chapter 2, verse 12. Now we see the authentication of Paul here in verses 15 to 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, wherein are some things hard to be understood, which the ignorant and unsteadfast rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So, Peter, in authenticating Paul, he points out three issues. First of all, the topic is the long suffering of God, which is for salvation. This is the very delay that will cause mockers to come mocking the doctrine of the second coming because God has delayed the second coming. He hasn't delayed the second coming. It appears to be a delay in the second coming. The second coming has been planned from time immemorial. In other words, the purpose of God's slackness in dealing with the promise of his return is to give people more opportunity and time to be saved. Second, in, in the second part of verse 15, Peter reminds the believers, this is something that Paul had also written to them, and it has come out of Paul's wisdom. So clearly we see here, Peter has an admiration of Paul and his wisdom. 
Peter refers to Paul as the beloved brother, our beloved brother. Now, despite the differences and disagreements between them, despite the negative incident that occurred in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21, Paul was still considered by Peter to be a beloved brother. Peter came to realize that Paul was correct in rebuking him. Now he mentions that Paul had written the same things to these believers. When Peter says, Paul wrote to you, he has at least the book of Galatians in mind because 2 Peter was written to the same body of believers as 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter 1 verse 1, Peter writes that he's writing to the, the brethren in Galatia. So the, the, the letter to the Galatians written by Paul is probably what he's talking about here. Third, in verse 16, Peter discusses the epistles of Paul and states that Paul also spoke of these things. Now, Peter's meaning is Paul also spoke of false teachers in the, his epistles. Then Peter admits that some of the things that Paul has written are very hard to understand. They're hard to be understood. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, the word dis, disnoitus is a Greek word which, which is used here to be, means hard to be understood. Everything Paul wrote is understandable, but some things he wrote require a little bit more time and effort to study. Peter said something else about Paul's writings. The false teachers are corrupting Paul's writings as they do other scriptures. The word translated rest, which we see here, as they do also, as they rest, the ignorant and unsteadfast rest, the word rest, W-R-E-S-T, is taken from the Greek word, which is streblu, which means to pervert or to twist. So the Greek word translated as other means another of the same kind. So this shows here that Peter considered Paul's epistles as scripture. It's important to understand here that it was not some church council who decided which books of the Bible were in the canon, which were not. If something was canonical, it was recognized immediately as being scripture. Peter clearly understands Paul's letters to be not just epistles, but he understands them to be scripture. They are of equal authority with the other scriptures, which is the Old Testament. And that which Peter writes about Paul shows they have been reconciled despite their earlier differences. We have the final warning in verses 17 to 18. You, therefore, beloved, knowing these things beforehand, beware, lest being carried away with the error of the wicked, you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in this final warning, Peter wants to emphasize two points here. First is in verse 17, beware of falling into false doctrine. That's what this holy epistle was about. The Greek word uh, used for fall in this verse is the one Paul used in Galatians 5, verse 4, where he wrote to fall from grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. The expression to fall from grace does not mean to lose salvation. It simply means that if someone goes back to the, when Paul was writing, if someone goes back to the law, he no longer operates in the sphere of grace. He has fallen from the sphere of grace and is now operating in the sphere of law. That's what Paul meant when he wrote Galatians. Now, if these believers fall into false doctrine, they'll also fall from the sphere of grace and will be operating in the sphere of works. It will mean that they have been carried away with the error of the wicked, to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and therefore they will fall from their own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the second point here is the exhortation to grow spiritually. To grow in grace means to understand positional truth. And this understanding comes by knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the use of the present imperative Greek tense here means the believers are commanded to keep on growing in grace. It's not a one-time event. Keep on growing in grace. Now we have the benediction in the second part of verse 18. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. The benediction here emphasizes the glory of God, both for the present and the future. 
And then it concludes then with the Jewish amen, which means so be it. And so be it. Thank you for coming along. Study hard and grow strong.